Welcome to Triad Night. Um, this year is going to be about vampires, blood, blood drinking, and uh, bleeding. And um, I'm going to invite you to do a bit of LARPing, as I'm going to not be me. But I'm going to be Thomas Springridge, a medical doctor, and you can be if you want, but no requirement, uh, can be aspiring vampire hunters working for the Second Inquisition. <clears throat> and this is one of your basic training lectures about what these things actually are and why you need to know some, something about this. So welcome. Uh, <clears throat> some disclosure first. Um, I work as an orthopedic and trauma surgeon uh, in the Helsinki University Hospital. Uh, and I'm a consultant surgeon in, in the private practice as well. I have no direct financial ties to the matters at hand, <coughs> neither the medical industry or, or the reality as capacity in industry. Um, I've been involved in the vampire research since 1994. And I have a strong emotional tie to our world and a strong interest in dismantling the superstitions and promoting real evidence-based medicine. My blood type would be negative if it would be of import important. Or will be. <coughs> I'm going to go through uh, some aspects of the real-life medicine and trauma traumatology related to blood, bleeding, blood drinking, with an emphasis on the so-called so vampires. And these will be the essentials of what you need to know when you go against these blights of humanity. <clears throat> context, first some historical context, uh, uh, perspective of when we actually learned uh, what blood doesn't, what does it do, some history of blood medicine. Uh, since, so, then some basics on what human blood actually is and what does it do. You need to know what's it all about to apply the knowledge to practice. Then some human anatomy and physiology. How do we work? Uh, then something about blood loss. Uh, and then things about vampire physiology. How do they work? Uh, and especially what's different from how do we work? We work. Uh, th then some physiology of vampires and some traumas with them. Through the ages, um, there was a the so-called humoral theory uh, invented by the Greeks uh, about 400 BC uh, that the body consists of four types of fluid. Blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Um, and this belief held until the mid 19th century. The theory was that, that all diseases result from imbalances of these fluids in humans, and the excess of blood caused fevers, apoplexy, and headache. And then bloodletting was uh, proposed as a cure. In the right lower picture, there's uh, a collection of lancets, which are instruments used for bloodletting punch a uh, hole in the vein and let some blood out. That was supposed to cure diseases. Now we are, of course, a bit more enlightened in this respect. Um, <clears throat> circulation, uh, that blood goes around and around, a heart actually pumps it, uh, was figured out and then experimentally proven in uh, 1628 by a pioneer of field. And then red blood cells were discovered in, in mid-19... Mid 16th century, um, mid 17th century, sorry. And um, no clue actually what the red blood cells do was had at the time. Uh, it took until almost to the turn of the, the 19th century that uh, oxygen was discovered and its role as the vital air to life uh, was proven. And then quite rapidly, uh, a theory of, of whole life as an oxidative process, burning of this vital air, 
was developed, uh, which helped us to demystify what life is. Um, <clears throat> and um, then hemoglobin uh, and its capacity to bind oxygen was identified in about 1980, 1850. Um, and after that, quite uh, Quickly, uh, the role of uh, blood as oxygen transport system to get the oxygen around around the body uh, to be burned um, was established, and that was when, in this respect, real reason began to triumph over superstition. <clears throat> Some landmarks of blood medicine. Um, the first transfusion was done in 1492 uh, to Pope Innocent VIII, seven. Um, and um, this was of course fatal because nobody really knew what they were doing. But he was thought to be suffering from from uh, too little blood of the four humors. <clears throat> then it took a while, three hundred years for the um, actual first successful human transfusion. Um, but and then the practice was uh, done, uh, not regularly, but every now and then. But about half of the pa patients reacted very severely, and most of the re reacting patients died. So it was no, not very good a cure. Um, and um, it took until... Uh, turn of the 20th century uh, until the blood groups, groups were discovered. Uh, I'll get back to them. Um, and this allowed us to develop safe uh, transfusion uh, methods, actually cross-match the blood that it does, the, the patient doesn't get the reactions. Um, and in 1914, uh, famous surgeon Pryle uh, wrote that um, the transfusion is the ideal treatment for surgical blood loss, which it still continues to be. Um, then blood storage was developed shortly after that. Uh, before that, it was only possible to transfuse blood uh, from one individual uh, to another directly because the blood coagulates when it's kept out of the body. The picture shows a, a syringe used for direct transfusion of blood from one person to another. But after the uh, citrate glucose solution uh, was added to the blood, it keeps from coagulating and it can be refrigerated or even frozen uh, and kept good for a while. Uh, then in 1926, uh, British Red Cross um, pulled up set up a blood transfusion service, and the first blood bank was then at, at 32. Uh, coined, the term was coined in Leningrad first. The hospital had actually a blood bank where they could get the blood they needed for, for the patients. Uh, and then one major advantage was then in 1939, uh, 30, uh, when the second major blood group system was discovered, which is the Reasus system. Um, and after that, transfusions became kind of safe, uh, as in the host reaction that, that people didn't get the blood. Uh, acute reactions to uh, transfusions. <clears throat> and then at 40, no, 1940, um, fractioning of the blood was invented, that the blood was split in the plasma and the cells. Uh, and then the plasma was broken down into uh, proteins and, and, and fluids, and they can be used to treat uh, different kind of conditions. And also, this uh, freezing of the products prolonged the, the shelf life of red blood cells quite dramatically. And uh, then at 1970, um, blood donations were uh, moved to volunteer basis. Before that, most of them were paid, and at first, uh, the, the bags had to be labeled. This is a paid donation, and this is a volunteer donation. The volunteer donations were considered safer. 
and then at the end of the last century, um, the identification of bloodborne diseases, which means hepatitis B and C and HIV, uh, came into light, and they can uh, the screening methods for them were developed. But for HIV, it was as late as ninety six. So um, this blood stuff, what it is? <clears throat> it's about half water, half red blood cells, and um, the picture. Does anybody have a light laser pointer? Any have a laser? No technocrats here. No isolation action members. All right. Um, um, it's uh, half, uh, the, um, about half of the volume uh, is actual water. And rest of the plasma is proteins, uh, which uh, are used for the uh, albumin is the most common protein in the in in the plasma, which keeps the osmotic pressure up so that the blood actually stays in that, inside the vessels. And then there are proteins which are have to do with the immune system. Thank you. I'm also so old that I can't read my own screen here um, <clears throat> without the glasses. Um, so, um, and uh, of the cell fraction, there's a bit of erythrocytes, most of the, the cells are erythrocytes, and then there's uh, a very few uh, so-called leukocytes, which have uh, immune functions, and then there are platelets, which act uh, as flowing and floating uh, small plugs, which uh, plug holes in the vessels when they appear. And uh, <clears throat> the main function of blood is the transport of oxygen uh, to the cells, and then uh, carbon dioxide back. And then blood works as a messenger system uh, to transport hormones and all kinds of messenger molecules around the body. And the white blood cells, as I said, are part of the immune system. And the main most important thing uh, for oxygen transport is the erythrocyte, which is the red blood cell. And uh, most of the blood uh, oxygen transported by blood is bound in hemoglobin molecules, which these cells are full of. Uh, <clears throat> and only about one and a half percent is solute, soluble oxygen in, in the in the water. And uh, each Hemoglobin molecule in the cell binds four oxygen molecules. Um, and um, as I said, secondary functions relate to CO2 transport, which means that when the uh, red blood cells and the hemoglobin molecules have uh, given up their oxygen in the cells, they can take up uh, carbon dioxide molecules and bring them back to the lungs to be uh, released in the air and exchange the oxygen again. And uh, then they have some functions uh, in with, to do with regulation of, of how the circulation works and the immune system works. Uh, a red cell, cell, blood cell, it's uh, shaped like this from the up, and, and this is a cross section. Um, there's no nucleus. When the cell, cell matures, it expel, uh, expels its nucleus. And there are about 270 million of these hemoglobin molecules in each cell which would account to 20 picograms. Each cell has a lifetime of about 100 to 120 days. Um, and there's about 5 million of them in one cubic millimeter, which means one microliter of blood. <clears throat> and uh, each hemoglobin molecule has four iron atoms, which actually bind the oxygen molecules. and uh, there's about two and a half grams of total iron in the circulating blood. Why this is important, we'll get back to that later. How this oxygen transport stuff works? Um, in the lungs, uh, the red blood cells, the hemoglobin in them, bind oxygen, which diffuses from the lungs to the cells. <clears throat> and then they go around uh, to the peripheral tissues, 
and then they release it there. And uh, nature has been quite clever in designing the system because in um, in the environment in the lungs, which are not very acidic, um, the hemoglobin binds to the cells easier and stronger um, than in the acidic conditions of the peripheral tissues, and this release happens there easier than in the lungs or on the way there. And uh, at rest, the blood carries about one liter of oxygen per minute, but our resting state consumption is only about 200 milliliters, uh, which means that there's quite a bit of reserve of, of oxygen circulating around for when we start to do something like exercise or fight or something like that. We need quite a more of the fuel. Um, then one important property of blood is that inside the vessels it doesn't clot, but when the vessels get broken, when there's bleeding, clotting occurs, and the blood forms a plug uh, to the hole. <clears throat> and um, what happens is that that when the blood vessel gets broken, uh, other parts of the body gets exposed uh, to the cells here, down the uh, inner lining of the blood vessel, and they clot forms, so that the platelets, which are the small plugs, they attach to the holes here. Um, kind of stick to the uh, area which is broken. And then inside the blood, there's protein, which is called fibrinogen, which then breaks down and uh, then uh, polymerizes to form a net uh, for which all the other parts of the blood stick to, and it forms a clot, which you can see in a small wound. It happens also in, in large wounds. Mm, this is the basics of how our bodies keep from bleeding to small holes. If you punch a small hole, make a bruise, it doesn't bleed a lot. Then back to the uh, blood groups, which are markers, kind of markers on the uh, red blood cells. Um, and the body recognizes our own cells as our own and foreign stuff as foreign, and the immune system attacks the foreign uh, bodies. And th that's why if I get transfusion uh, of a wrong blood site, my own immune system recognizes those as foreign and attacks them, and that causes the severe blood transfusion reactions. But if I get a suitable blood type, my immune system doesn't recognize them uh, as foreign and accepts it, and then I can use the transfused blood as my own. And, and there are tens of parallel uh, markers, or marker systems, and the most important of these are the ABO and the rhesus D systems, which were discovered in the early 1900s. Then I'll move on to human anatomy about how this blood gets around. The human body can be broken down into different systems. And for today, we are mostly interested in uh, the circulatory system, which has uh, the heart, which pumps blood to the extremities uh, from the left side. Then the blood returns uh, to the right side of the heart. Uh, and then it. Mm -hmm. This ran out. And then uh, it goes to the lungs and then around the body again. To very strongly simplify things, this is how it works. Air comes in and out, blood goes round and round, and oxygen is good for the cells. That's, <laughs> that's a quote from a trauma surgeon in Meilahti, Ari Leppäniemi, but it's actually what this life is all about. Um, <clears throat> The gas exchange occurs here in the lungs. Uh, the, pulmon the, the picture is so that the blood, uh, the blue vessels are where the blood is not oxygenated, and the red one is where the oxygen concentration is high, or content is high. 
and the heart, right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs. Gas exchange occurs. Carbon dioxide goes out. Oxygen goes in. And then the blood goes to the left side of the heart and then circulates around to the body. And the capillary bed, bed the, the large vessels going are just transport kind of motorways. And all the um, actual gas exchange occurs in the very small capillary vessels, which we have everywhere, and quite a lot of those. Mm. And the systemic arteries are the high pressure system. Um, it's about, we like to use the archaic uh, millimeters of mercury, but it's about 1.16 bars uh, in a normal person, which equates to about 160 centimeters of, of, of water, which means that, that the pressure is equal to a water column pressure about this high. So yes, this means that if you cut off a big artery, you get gases or blood or very long, long sprouts of blood, blood, blood because of the pressure. The veins are low pressure, even the neck veins have a negative pressure uh, because of, of the uh, gravitational effects. And if you punch a hole in the neck vein, you actually can get air sucked in there which is called air embolism. We'll get back to that later. Also, and um, the capillaries where the gas exchange occur, they're very small. They're about one, the size of one erythrocyte, about 10 micrometers, so that the actual red blood cells, they go in a row uh, through them, which makes every cell in the body be quite near one of the capillaries. And the, the gas exchange or the diffusion uh, distances are very small, and this actually works. Um, <clears throat> there's about five liters of blood in each one of us. It depends a bit on if you're very low weight, then the percentage is more like eight. If you're uh, large and especially fatty, then the percentage goes down to about six. Um, the blood volume circulates around about once per minute at rest. Um, and the distribution uh, where the blood goes, it varies with phys physical activity and stress. If you're just sitting around, your muscles don't need much of blood. But if you're running a marathon, then most of the blood is going through the, through the leg muscles, especially. Um, though the head, the brains need quite constant uh, uh, supply of oxygen and, and nutrients. And the flow in, in one carotid artery stays about the same at three, liters, uh, three deciliters per minute. And in the picture, uh, you can see the typical uh, at-rest distribution of, of, uh, of blood volume where it goes. Quite a bit of it goes to the liver uh, and kidneys and, and not that much into the skeletal muscle. But this changes when, when uh, under exertion. And um, <clears throat> this is a picture of the cardiac output, which means, which is the um, amount of blood put out by the heart per minute. At rest, it's about five liters, meaning the blood volume. But uh, when the work rate goes up, which is right on the graph, the CO, which means cardiac output, can go up like three or four times, depending a bit on how a how, uh, trained person you are. And uh, heart rate goes up, which is HR, but stroke volume, which means the, the volume of blood pumped out, pumped out by one stroke of the heart, reaches a maximum at kind of quite moderate uh, levels of work. And then because the heart beats so fast, it doesn't have the time to fill up, and then the stroke volume goes down. This is secondary. What it adds up is that the cardiac output goes up to a certain maximum, which is dependent on, on, on each person's physical conditions. So this is basically how, do, how we get by. Um, then about trauma. The common reasons for rapid traumatic death are blood loss, loss of airway, major brain injury, 
but all of these lead to uh, loss of oxygen deli delivery to the cells. <clears throat> and um, in prolonged bleeding, what happens is uh, the bl blood clotting gets worse. This is called coagulopathy. Um, and aim of trauma treatment is to stop the bleeding uh, to limit the coagulopathy and restore normal uh, body function. The so-called multi-organ failure is kind of just the basically a, uh, the body just giving up or infections, they happen later. They never kill a person on the scene. This is our focus for today. And um, bleeding less than about half a liter, it's mainly cosmetic. It doesn't affect uh, the body that much. We can compensate loss of blood to a certain extent. Um, about a liter uh, is the amount one can bleed uh, quite safely. Uh, compensation me mechanism set in, heart rate goes up, blood pressure might go a bit down, but but no, but the person is not not in real real danger. After that, uh, symptoms of shock start to set in, and uh, it starts to get dangerous. And small wounds stop by themselves, but large holes, which mean, mean basically most of bleeding, um, which is really dangerous, needs some kind of intervention. intervention. Uh, arteries have a muscle in the arterial walls, which contract when they are uh, especially severed, like perpendicular to the, to the artery, and they can co contract for a while and close the vessel. But in about half an hour, the muscle runs out of energy and strength, and the, and the vessel opens up again. So we have some time to get access to the vessels and, and treat, the, treat the problem surgically. Um, and just so that you know, if somebody is bleeding to death, they are not doing it like they do in the movies. It's not, oh, I'm going to die. Uh, but it's lo slow loss of consciousness. It's kind of fainted away, not going out with a bang. And there won't be a girl loss either. Uh, blood loss. Um, shocks, shock can be classified in four stages. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's blood loss here, milliliters. Of, or percentage of, of circulating volume, and then what happens? A class one, which means minor bleeding less than, than a liter, uh, pulse rate stays quite normal, blood pressure stays normal, respiratory rate stays quite normal, uh, urine output stays normal. That's a good measure. That's a good good measure of of, of uh, how well the tissues are perfused and how good volume there is circulating around because kidneys shut down urine production when they don't get enough blood. There won't be any certain central nervous systems, uh, central nervous system symptoms, uh, and nobody's going to die of blood loss of one blood bag donation. Then class 2 shock, up to about 30% circulating volume. Uh, heart rate gets a bit elevated to something like a bit above 100. Blood pressure might be a bit decreased. Uh, respiratory rate goes a bit up. Urine output goes a bit down. And usually people get anxious. But still, if the bleeding stops, you're not going to die of it. Class 3, up to about 2 liters of 40% of volume. Pulse rate is elevated quite a lot. Uh, blood pressure gets, goes down. Uh, even further, and uh, people get confused. It's not only an anxiety, but the brain uh, doesn't get enough enough oxygen. Uh, they can be don't know where they are, things like that. And uh, you might die of this. Probably not if the bleeding stops, but this kind of bleeding usually needs some kind of intervention. It might be blood transfusion to allow for for uh, the normal clotting to take care of the actual bleeding. 
but some kind of things are beneficial for you. And then if you're in class 4 shock, which means more than 40% lost volume, you're about to die. Uh, pulse rate goes over 140. Um, blood pressure is, might be 90 systolic, which means severely decreased. Respiratory rate is very rapid. Try breathing 35 times a minute. It gets exhausting. And uh, the people are lethargic. They're just fading away because they can't really do anything because there, there isn't enough circulating volume to keep them going. <coughs> what do we do then? Um, in the heart, this is a, uh, that's a liver in there, um, in the middle, and there's a wound here suffered in a fight which goes through the abdominal wall on the left, through the liver, um, and the bleeding has been treated with something which is called damage control surgery. Uh, it's an rubber, elongated rubber balloon which is filled with water which is put into the hole and then inflated and it presses the blood vessel vessels inside the liver closed. The liver is very difficult to um, kind of suture together, but these kind of temporary measures can, uh, can give, give time for the actual clots to form. And uh, in, in the emergency room, what we do is stop the bleeding and replace losses of volume to allow the body to function normally restore gas exchange, which means make sure that oxygen gets in, carbon dioxide gets out. Uh, and then these kind of injuries can be then treated later definitely if they need definite treatment. Broken bones can be fixed and so on. But the primary air of the aim of the first two hours is to keep the body functions normal. Then um, once a patient has bled, um, what happens? In short term, uh, the body replaces the lost volume by, plus, uh, by adding the, the plasma volume in the, in the blood, and the, the relative amount of red cells goes down. This is called dilution anemia, which is an effective compensatory mechanism for a short while. You can get by with lower hemoglobin by the heart beating faster, and the blood going around faster to transport the same amount of oxygen per time. Um, the actual production of new blood cells takes about a week to uh, start and produce new blood cells. This is the cascade of, of, of uh, what happens in the bone marrow um, when hormones and growth factors make the stem cell start producing new blood cells. And erythropoietin is a, pro, uh, is a hormone uh, produ produced normally by the kidneys in response to decreased levels of oxygen. And it causes the body to produce more blood cells, red bl blood cells, in reaction to, to uh, blood loss, which is the usual cause of, of reduced oxygen levels in the tissues. And after about two weeks, Quite severe blood loss can be re replaced by the body if the nutritional state, state, state is normal and there's enough iron available uh, to replace the losses uh, caused by the bleeding. <clears throat> but with sustained blood loss, uh, iron availability is an issue. Um, there was only two and a half grams of iron in the whole body. Uh, in the in the circulating blood, which means about half a gram of iron uh, in a liter of blood, and the normal daily dietary intake is about one milligram to maybe four. In anemia, the body makes iron absorption more efficient, uh, and in, it can be about up to four milligrams. But to replace the hemoglobin in one liter of blood uh, takes kind of three months of normal uh, dietary iron absorption. And if this can't be met, uh, the produced red cells will have less hemoglobin than usually, uh, and then less oxygen transport uh, capacity. 
auto substitution can be used to alleviate this problem, which means that, that if somebody has bled, we can give them iron, and, and then the production of hemoglobin is not limited by the available iron. The iron stores in the body are, are about a gram, uh, so two liters can be replaced by the stores, but then the stores are uh, depleted uh, and they must be gotten some, from somewhere. This is important in the respect that that the consumption and use of iron products can be used to track bleeding, which brings us to vampires. To our current knowledge, these vampires are dead humans, so-called undead, animated by an unknown force, and the condition appears to be contagious, as reports indicate new vampires being created by an existing one. We don't know, no, we're not quite sure about how it actually works, but that's how it seems to be. Um, there are some drastic physiological changes. Uh, the internal organs wither, and the body fluids are replaced by a blood light substance. Um, there's no heartbeat, and there's no proper blood, pr blood pressure. The nervous, nervous system appears to remain functional. They feel pain. Um, and then they do seem to be able to heal injuries r more rapidly than humans. And it appears that vampires are dependent on the consumption of blood of living organisms. And um, reports indicate that animal blood can suffice, but human blood seems to be preferred. And this is why you all are here. Because they make a significant threat to our human population. Um, how this getting nutrients or fuel or whatever from blood actually works remains yet to be elucidated. Um, but it seems that the blood has to be fresh, um, stored, fewer, fewer, stored blood loses its potency. And it also seems that fractionated blood products are not so useful for them. Uh, so this makes our current blood bank pro protocols quite safe in the respect that they are not in of interest to the hemovores. Mm. The vampires have to spend quite time, quite a bit of time uh, eating, if it can be called eating, um, <clears throat> because the flow rate of the accessed vessel limits the speed when they can feed. The large neck vessels, they have about four, maybe five liters uh, of flow per minute, uh, four to five minutes per liter. Uh, and in the wrist, it takes about five to ten minutes for a liter of blood to flow around. So if the vampire would be able to drink all of it to get a liter of blood from the uh, wrist, it takes maybe five to ten minutes. And also the size of the hole of the vessel limits the speed. And also when a person is being bled, uh, the onset of shock reduces the blood flow as the blood pressure goes down, and this also limits the, limits the speed even more. It though seems possible that the interaction of the vampire and the, and the victim uh, somehow affects the systems of shock, driving the humans into hypercompensation, um, which makes the feeding a bit more rapid. We are still lacking with experimental data on that. So basically, draining a person, you can get maybe four liters out of somebody uh, because you can't drain all the blood without special measures. Uh, takes about half an hour unless they go for a central vessel, which means here in the groins or in the abdomen. <clears throat> and also, feeding from an artery is quite messy because of the high, high pressure. And if, if they bite the vein uh, and are a bit careless about it, they might pour air, air embolism, which then we can track. 
Um, this he- feeding habit of the vampires makes them need a kind of a population of humans to feed. And um, we're a bit unclear about the minimum amount of blood a v- vampire needs, but it probably is the order of half a liter a day or more. Um, our data show that with stress and activity, I mean, vampire can need significantly larger amount of blood in a single night. So this is a very conservative estimate. Um, from blood donation data, we know that uh, a typical human can donate about half a liter of blood for two months and then replace the uh, red blood cell mass. Some are more rapid and some are slower. The best, best don- blood donors can maybe donate one and a half liters every two months. With the use of erythropoietin, this can be driven up. Um, and counting from these, in a stable situation, uh, a single vampire is in about 50 human victims to feed on regularly to sustain the existence. And if they are very active, uh, then this amount goes up. The iron uh, can be used to track the vampires, or at least find possible uh, areas of vampiric, vampiric activity. Uh, as iron is recycled by the body, body very efficiently, blood cells only live for less than three months, but the iron in them is uh, taken up and used to used in other new blood cells, which are then produced. Um, and usually, if a person has iron deficiency anemia, the reason is chronic bleeding. Um, and uh, as this causes all kinds of fatigue uh, symptoms, public awareness has been raised about the uh, symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, and also you should, sometimes the reason is cancer uh, in, the, in the intestine, which causes chronic bleeding. Also, in some young women, it's been theorized that uh, menstrual bleeding can be so large that it, it, it um, makes them anemic. But I can tell you with confidence that the usual reason is a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> And this has led to public awareness programs, which then lead to increased rates of contacts to the healthcare systems, when we can spot the prisoners with iron deficiency anemia, and then use the laboratory data patterns to analyze sudden increases of, 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 of uh, cases to locate potential target areas. And especially in Finland here, the comprehensive public healthcare is very useful in this respect. And in some other countries, it's more difficult when you have to access different systems. And also, um, we can use the iron sales from pharmacies uh, as an indicator for for people needing more iron, dietary iron. Uh, some of the heme wars know that their victims get anemic if they drink enough of them, and then they direct them to use uh, iron supplementation, uh, which can give us a clue where they wa- where they are. And uh, any use of erythropoietin as a horm- hormone should be routinely investigated. And also in Finland, we have a convenient law, uh, which states that um, all cases of death which are not known caused by a known disease uh, should be investigated by the um, uh, coroners, and uh, causes of death should be determined. And this also allows us to uh, spot any an- abnormalities or anomalies in the causes of death. Then we move on to vampires and trauma. Um, the vampires, they don't bleed because they don't have blood pressure. They don't need to breathe. Um, 
they don't have the usual problem caused by a head injury uh, in normal human is that um, it causes bleeding inside the cranium. But with the vampires, uh, they don't bleed, so they don't get brain hemorrhages and things like that. So he head injuries are just like any other injuries, bruises the wrist or so. And they don't get infected, and they already have multi-organ failure, which means that they don't dilate either. And um, if damaged enough, they fall into a catatonia-like state, but they're not truly destroyed. And a stake through the heart does the same. But the vampire is not dead. And they are very easily injured by fire and sunlight. And they do suffer from losses of function from pain. If you hurt them enough. And also loss of biomechanics. If you break muscles and break bones, they don't function as well. But we would be aware of of their ability to heal the injuries quite rapidly. And um, some practical advice. You need to rethink how to injure them. You need to cause biomechanical damage, long bones, large muscles. You need to be aware that there won't be any concussion effects. And uh, in a human th thoracic and abdominal trauma, is uh, quite lethal because of the bleeding in, into the body cavities, but for vampires, it doesn't really matter. They are susceptible to fire, and all bodies should be burned. They are not. No injury is permanent to them until, uh, until the body is ash. And with this, I open a few, open a few, a few questions, and wish you happy hunting. Well, um, air embolism, air in the heart, is either caused by a uh, hole in the in the vessel or in some medical procedure. But if we get an autopsy report indicating an air embolism in a person who has died at home or somewhere else, it's probably a clue that there's been a vampire in there. Normal people don't get it. Hello. Uh, in the same vein, um, you mentioned air embolisms. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned uh, air embolisms were pressure related. Would it be beneficial for the vampire? Would there be a significant difference if the uh, subject was lying down? Yes. That yeah. That makes them rarer because the effect comes from the puncture hole being higher up than the heart. If you turn a person upside down and put a hole in the leg, the same happens. There was the next one. Yes, uh, I was wondering how painful is a vampire attack, attack? I came a bit late, so I don't know if you already answered the question. But I was wondering because uh, you mentioned a state of shock from blood loss and that sort of stuff. Well, our experiments seem to indicate that, that the actual bite isn't painful at all, and the victims feel some kind of a uh, kind of euphoria. And that's probably part of the, the, the mechanism how the vampire uh, works around the normal shock uh, mechanism of the body and, and keeps the, the, gets up the hypercompensation. Uh. What uh, what about without uh, uh, vampiric sedation? Then I guess it's just normal uh, attack as, as any attack. Yeah, I don't think they are any more capable of causing pain than than than, than any other creature.
Uh, you also mentioned that feeding from the groin would be faster. Are there any reports of groin-related vampire attacks? Of course, of course, of course, there are. Uh, so they are not stupid. So since the vampires are not technically alive, they don't have um, body warmth, right? No, at normal state. No, they seem to be at the ambient temperature. So they are basically the same uh, heat as the room temperature would yeah. be. Yeah. So would that make them slower in the winter or like unable <laughs> to move because it's they are at freezing point? That would be very nice, but it seems that the animation, whatever is I mean, animating them doesn't care about temperatures in that respect. Okay. Pause the box here, please. Okay, so I've heard this weird r rumor that some vampires might sparkle in the daylight. <laughs> <laughs> Where does this uh, sparkle come from and can I get blind if I see it? <laughs> <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> that would be my, my, my the, the reports I've read uh, say that they decompose into ash or some of them just burn, but there's no sparkling, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, if a vampire tries to hide its feeding by, let's say, dropping the victim from a uh, from a 16-story building. Can you tell on the scene or later that the blood amount was atypical? Um, it's usually, if, if the blood, blood amount's been very low, it's quite apparent. But um, we have this accident investigation uh, committees and, and uh, professionals whose job is to actually find out if the causes of death has been what it appears to be. And it's possible to de determine the uh, amount of blood the, the victim has had when the accident has ha happened. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, people with uh, hemochromatosis, they have a, an iron buildup and they can't get rid of the iron. Um, would that extra iron uh, make them significantly better donors? Is it a significant difference? And if it is, would you consider them an at-risk group? Um, the hemochromatosis, um, it's a buildup of iron uh, outside the, the, the uh, red blood cells and uh, going in the wrong place. And it's a, it's, it's a form of iron which is mined to the tissue so that it can't be mobilized for, for blood use or production. I don't think it, it, it makes a difference. But there are diseases. Uh, past the box in front, there was a question here first. Um, but there are diseases like uh, polycytemia vera, which is a natural, uh, it's, a, um, it's a disease of the regulation of, of red blood cell production. And, and they, the persons do produce uh, excess of red blood cells even in normal state. And, and these kind of person are definitely an at-risk group, group, yeah. Well, doctor, uh, you mentioned that the comprehensive public health service is a real advantage in, in Finnish investigation. How big of a factor would that be, in, say, in comparison to British or, uh, or US system of healthcare? No, the British, uh, the NHS is quite good as well because it's quite comprehensive, it's widely available and quite trusted. But in the sta in the US, uh, while well, the healthcare system is composed of, of quite many for-profit organizations um, who have their own patient data files and their own laboratories and so on, uh, piecing the data together from there is more difficult. There are some initiatives uh, as research on, on public health there, which which uh, can cover the problem in some areas. But other than that, uh, we need to use some um, unconventional resources uh, to track the 
or combine the data from the different hospitals, but it, it's it's quite worksome. And also in that kind of splinter healthcare system, uh, cracks can be formed, which can be used by the vampires to their advantage. There was a question back. Mr. Stone Rose. Yes, uh, to continue on the uh, on the same track as the, the previous uh, question, um, do you see that the upcoming um, uh, SOTE uh, <laughs> upheaval is a risk uh, to the to the detection system that that you create? It has uh, up, upsides and downsides. Um, it depends a bit how will we implement at the end. Uh, if it's if it is turned into a, a US-like splintered system, then we need to work around it. But this, as, the, as all the uh, services are organized by the so-called municipalities, uh, who have central registers, and also our new Kanta system, which, com which keeps central health reg register of all the systems in Finland, helps us quite a bit. Okay, so um, since you're obviously an expert in this stuff, um, let's say that um, you mentioned that a vampire would need a herd of around 50 people to feed from if you kind of wanted to keep on going the same people over and over again. Now, let's say that, that this vampire uh, wanted to kind of be a little bit more efficient about it and uh, say wanted to get a herd of 50 people, lock them up in a basement, kind of keep leaving them on the regular uh, maybe a little bit from everybody at each time, but has sort of like you know, the appropriate medical care that would actually you know keep them producing at a peak efficiency. Um, what do you think would be the minimum number of people that would actually be required, you know, if they were receiving appropriate medical care? And what do you think the cost of that would be approximately? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Well, it, <laughs> my guesstimate that it's about five. Nice. <laughs> um, with enough iron, use of erythropoietin, nutrient, uh, kind of nutri good kind of nutrient uh, balance or or replacement nutrients, maybe that. But they need to be quite proficient in in, in the medical care. What about the cost of that? <laughs> no, I think it would be quite cheap, actually, because iron is cheap, erythropoietin costs a bit, but other than that, they don't need any special facilities, other than the seller, of course. <laughs> yeah, so I've understood, understood that uh, when a vampire feeds on a person, it um, somehow uh, erases the memory of that act or otherwise uh, alters the mental state of the human in question. So wh what kind of knowledge does uh, modern medicine have about that mind-altering stuff now? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> our memory works so, works so that um, most things are kept in working memory for about four minutes, five minutes, and then passed on to uh, permanent, be formed into permanent memories. And uh, it would look like that the, the feeding act blocks this transfer of working memory into uh, permanent memory. And that would explain why the victims don't have recollection of what happens. There are other instances like that in other like concussion, when you get a uh, rain, rain, uh, you're hit in the head, can lose your, you have amnesia for maybe half an hour. One of the signs for a proper brain injury, like loss of consciousness, is that the victim can't remember what happened. Yeah, so it, it's, because it's uh, amnesia and not like altered memories or something. Anything we like can't that. really explore the memories to that level that we would know it. Yeah. Or it's not on your security clearance. For vampire hunting, uh, you mentioned that vampires are vulnerable to fire and uh, sunlight. So fire we can weaponize, it's quite well understood. But 
What is it about sunlight that makes them weak? We don't know. So we can't count on weaponizing ultraviolet in the form of black lights? Or? It's, it's been tried, but to not, not a great success. Thank you. And then the last question goes to the person over there. Uh, so, uh, someone mentioned uh, at-risk groups, and also erythropoietin has been mentioned many times. So, uh, sometimes like professional athletes use erythropoietin as uh, doping. And so, and I guess uh, they would have more or better qu quality blood for um, uh, hemo war. So, <clears throat> has, is there any data uh, about uh, like the amount of vampire-related deaths among pro professional athletes? <clears throat> well, uh, the epidemiological data actually shows that uh, professional athletes are more prone to sudden deaths, about 50s or, or 60s. Uh, it's been advertised as a uh, Condition related to heart, a trained heart, kind of, it, it, it's more prone to attacks of arrhythmias, but there might be something else to it as well. Thank you. <laughs>